here we are again, about to paint on plein air again, uh, this time on a sheet of hardboard. Just no priming, you can prime hardboard of course, but this time just directly onto the hardboard, which is quite absorbent. But a little chapel of carmarans, a different subject altogether. We've got painting oils, and uh, we've got all these lovely irises and flowers to paint in the sunshine here today as well. So it should be a very lively painting in the Impressionist style. start, let me tell you a little bit about the chapel itself. As you can see, I've done some paintings in here earlier and made films already about the creation of the uh, interior of this chapel. The story is a very romantic one, but rather sad. Uh, a young girl falls in love with a young boy, the son of the Lord of Antrikes, about 15 kilometres away. He, the father's off on the medieval wars. He has to come and stay with the young girl, the daughter of the Lord of Astang. They're both about 15 years old. They fall in love. They live together a while there. But there's another evil lord who also wants her, and he arranges the death of the young boy. And she then only lasts a few months, is very sad and dies broken-hearted. Then the Lord of Astang creates this wonderful chapel in memory of them both. And in fact, I've written a poem about it as well, and uh, created some music for that. And the poetry is on the walls here too, in French and English. So what I've done is created paintings about that story, and made the cross of local old oak planks, I made the candle arborists from local wood from my garden, and then also in a series of illustrations and semi-medieval paintings relevant to the story of this chapel. Let me show you them just quickly before we get on with our painting. Yeah, the uh, unicorn symbolises good, and the dragon bird below evil. And across from there we have the water spirit of Lot here. And then we have the patron saint of uh, animals, nature. my plastic palette, I've got my palette of oils, my spare oils, my brushes, a painting knife, terps, a jar with some turpentine substitute in it, and um, I'm about ready to go there. Just a small selection of brushes, some flats and uh, filberts, and one little round. I'm set up and ready to go. Well, I'm going to I'm going to start off the painting by using quite a bit of white. I'm just going to use a little uh, pointed round to work out the composition with a small amount of white paint with some terps. Let's work it out into sections now, into quarters and eighths. So as long as I get my basic salient points, my basic measurements correct, I can do the rest as I paint because I've got to be very rapid painting the light, trying to catch it, catch it before changing. I only have to indicate the steps at the moment, I have to start drawing every step in. And really mix up some colour, get plenty of white going on this because the board soaks it in. And we'll go for the sky first. Take some cerulean blue, break into it. going on in there. A little bit purpler because of the light today. And at first the colours might seem a bit dark. A little touch of, of mauve in it, a bit more warmth back there. We might have a little bit of cream in a moment. 
and really work some darks into that, like down to here. And by using the blue and the brown we can adjust the coolness of the shadows. Don't worry about details yet, we're going to work on those later. Let's just block everything in at the moment so we can work one colour over another too as well. I want to move these trees a bit more this way, fit them in, and we do so. My painting, my composition. Nobody's going to come here with a photograph and say, ah oh, look, that's how it was, you changed it. Who cares? As long as it works. What we're doing really is staining the board, isn't it? I mean at the moment we're just taking these thin down oil paints and staining. into the steps places. Okay now we're moving from my largest brush to, to a medium size. I'm going to use this one now. Firstly working my way down. I'll look at these trees here I think at the minute. Very light green. Just little touches of colour here and there just to give the impression of the, of the light. I'm not uh, trying to be exact or Just to tickle the colours in, not have to be that fine, we're not painting lots of detail, we are atmosphere and light. The right colours, the right places, the right shapes, everything will appear for us. Hello, blazing and building up on like a watercolour almost. Yeah, brought you some lunch. Oh, thank you. Now we come down to a, a fine round to start doing some of these um, branches we've got in the background here and uh, trees. Okay, we're getting all these different coloured greens in now. The cools and warms. Before we paint the flowers, let's try the daisies. Use our fine pointy brush and do the white petals first, put the yellows in afterwards. Just catching the light behind here. Let's see the irises finish just there. The daisies come right through up here. And because the board's fairly absorbent, it means that I'm painting now the fat onto the lean, just as I promised you earlier. So you can see how it works. back to the um, daisies and put in the yellows. Now these gorgeous pinks that are here. I'm going to have to use some rose for that. Wonderful fixture. See if we can get that red with the sort of purpley pinks that are there. 
Let's see how that comes down to about here, so they come in just over here. Just a little mauve in there to cool down against the pinks. Now back up into the, the reds, which we can now pick some more orangey pinks. Back here, much redder. Or cadmium. Start on the actual irises, I think. lovely purple and blue irises which are going to be, to be absolutely correct or it's not going to work. Now then colour for them. And we can go stronger or darker with these purples. So with a few flicks of the brush, a few flicks of the brush we can have an iris. To make these a bit cooler, I want to um, make a very light blue, just some cerulean again. But that now links with the blue in the background, which all helps to pull the painting together, doesn't it? I'm even going to go a bit darker blue still on that, and use some of the um, cobalt blue now. Just to get in some of these cooler blues under here. We'll come down to our final darks here in the foreground, cools and warm darks. And we have to look at some of these darks in amongst the petals too. There we are, complete work. And the light's just dropping off a bit with the clouds going. Well, that's it, we're done. So, I'm quite pleased with that. Would we be in a couple of hours? And uh, it's a very rapid way of painting and very atmospheric. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. It's lovely to be outdoors painting again. Always better to be outdoors doing the real thing than painting with a photograph, I feel. Right, let's pack up then. <laughs>
protecting in his palms the fruit he ripened and matured. Running, dancing, foal of spring, reveled in your joy of life, innocent child of sunlit, Gaelic fields, summer light so gold, hazy, lazy days of carefree joy in dreams to be a bride. He took your sleep, and in it placed his dreams. Nature's force entwined your souls in fate's decree embraced. How he feared, yet hoped, strong youth of France on love's long lance, ancient forces, ancient lands, tilled by those hands of ages past, time seeds cast. As death's dark shadow pants him fast, and in that moment darkness stole his light. The bright flame shared now lost, as passion's fire was quenched, how cold as night. Her soul called out to no reply, her empty dreams grew longer by each day. As in a trance, her mind was fogged by nothing more than memory's sweet remorse. Her sylph-like body so refined, with gentle steps a curtsy now, she bowed in winter's grey. The candle dim within her spirit's lamp, she looked down deep into the water's past. He beckoned her to come, to join him, dark and cold, embracing to the last. She sang a song so sweet, so calm, so clear, that echoes distant of her carried on for memories past. A nightingale repeats her call. ceremony of my younger daughter Kerry where in fact we had the Hindu ceremony which was an absolutely beautiful and wonderful thing. Uh, I took many photographs uh, of the saris and all of the colours and I thought I'd like to do a presentation painting for the parents. So I've got Rajiv here and Kerry here and I'm using a composite of various ornamental parts of the photographs I've got, the fruit and uh, some of the brass items um, and I'm going to use all of those colours in the background uh, as a pattern basically and just a slight image of the father and mother as well. It would be a nice semi-abstract painting to do and abstract means obviously to take from. So we're going to take from the images that we have and reuse them to make one picture that will give the feeling of the whole event I hope. I should enjoy doing it. Now you can see I've already done some gold leafing here. I put a bit of the glue size on and then pressed on the gold leaf afterwards just because I want some of that gold to glimmer and glow through in different lights and give another dimension to the painting. You can see I then started working out the design in uh, white watercolour pencil again. Something I like to do with a dark acrylic background, Prussian blue and black again. It means if I make a mistake that I can wipe off the pencil very easily and it leaves the dark showing through. I've got the standard set of oil paints. Here's my palette again, so you can see all the paints I'll normally use. And then I have my main palette of paints set out here, and of course my plastic palette next to it. And just a small series of brushes, flats and rounds, that I think will do the job for this painting. Some terps, an old rag, it's all we're going to need. Now where to start? Well, here's a picture of some of the saris and the collection that I've made. And here also is a picture of um, the fruits and uh, part of the event that I'm going to be working from. You can see I'm going to be using the fruit from this area here, and obviously these two heads, part of this uh, ceremonial dish here, and then we'll start just enjoying painting whatever colours we want and patterns we want from this intuitively in the areas here. So we're going to use this to abstract from, we're going to make a painting that's linked between our emotions and our heads and the intuitive colours and where we want to place them here. To start off with actually the bottom, I'm going to place down the colours, I quite like this red colour here. I'm going to work with some of the background colours here and some of the fruits at first. Let's take a nice half inch flat at first, get it nice and ready to 
work with again. There we go. Now down here, what colour should we have? A band of these different reds because they've got a rich, rather lovely rich colour. These um, these rich reds down here, just rather nice against the turban as well because the turban is the same sort of reddy brown going on down there. So we have to decide just as an abstract painting what colours we want where. Let's experiment first with this colour here then. So we'll take some Indian red and just put a bit of that there just to try it out. See what we want where. I think that's quite a nice colour. We'll take that straight into here. Maybe I'll put a bit more red down through on the vertical there. Right, we've made a start. Next we want to be painting the portraits. I think we'll get those colours basically sorted out and then uh, I can start thinking about the colours that relate to it around it. So we're just adding some yellow ochre to some white, a little touch of rose and then some of the shadows are putting a little um, ultramarine and a touch of burnt sienna in here, just gradually building up these flesh tones. Darker colours here now. Need to work back across the other figure. Don't need to do much more on the portraits there for the moment. And of course, with the uh, darker, more Indian colours of the skin here, uh, I'm going to be working in a different range of colours again. So I'm going back to my little quarter inch. And we'll start to establish some of these terms here. I'm going to look again at the Indian red and the burnt sienna. And a little yellow ochre. Let's see what we can establish there. So using our mixtures of yellow ochre and burnt sienna, we can gradually make up the flesh tones, adding cools and warms between those two, and then working into it as well with some uh, raw amber and even some uh, ultramarine blue as we go along. Here you see we're actually adding more of the uh, burnt sienna and even some Indian red into it. Don't make the teeth too white like a toothpaste advert. In this case we're using our cream with the lemon yellow and white taken down a bit with yellow ochre, and then even a little bit of cool colour into that to tone it back a bit. So a touch of Sara Lee to make it a little bit greyer. You can use the same colour for the white of the eyes as well. You can see I'm still painting very loosely using a large brush. And I'll gradually come down to my smaller and fine work later as I'm doing here now. Carefully painting between the teeth but only indicating. Doesn't want to stand out like a sore thumb. We're just indicating those shadows in between the teeth. And the ears are indicated and painted just as loosely. Now we need to work on the father's head behind here. Hopefully it wouldn't be too difficult. Burnt umber and a little yellow ochre. Maybe a bit of green over there in a minute. We'll just let's have a coat. And I think a little bit of a smile he's got there. Not much of one, but enough. Might just reflect a tad of that green as well. Maybe a little of the purple in it. Take it back a bit. I'll come into that with the darker. Huh? So I only need a few brush strokes just to indicate. That's all we're doing. So back to our ultramarine and the burnt sienna again. We can go darker yet, but we don't need to right at this moment. So we'll just bring out our other head so we can see where it is. We'll start doing future work. I come back across to uh, Rajiv's mother. Work on down now to the father. 
finer details onto the hair and some of the decoration. We're only going to indicate these jewels, we're not going to try and paint every single one. It's no way I'm going to start doing that. Come back to the uh, head of the girl. And we'll start on her hair and her jewellery. And again, we've got these lovely darks going on with the blue and the brown, which doesn't show that much at the moment because, of course, we've uh, got a dark background anyway. But it will make more sense when. gold showing through there and some of it's going to be coming up into here these bits of jewellery we can just let the brush flicker about doing the effect of these little flowers as long as we've got one colour in front of another as long as the shapes are approximately right we should get the effect wonderful creamy effect we can get with oil paint that you can't easily get with any other paint in fact. Acrylic is alright but the oil paint really does give you these beautiful chances to use it like strawberries and cream. Not what you paint if you look for colour you can find it. To reduce If we want to use, make something warmer, then obviously if you put something cool next to something that's uh, warm, it will make the warm look even warmer. So if I take, um, for instance, a little light blue here with the cerulean and white, and look at the difference it makes to uh, the hat here. keep the whole thing going so don't want to concentrate too much just on the portraits now which we've well worked into I would like to come back down onto some of this fruit which I'm looking forward to hitting and let's look at some of the colours we've got down here which again will shine against these ones I've worked a lot more on the fruit, keeping it very loose and very abstract, just keeping it as a, as a design. Nice loose brush strokes, one colour to another, one shape to another, basically building up these nice chunks of fruit to make a pattern. And we'll put flat shapes against textural shapes. We'll play pattern against pattern, as well as colour against colour and tone against tone. You see now we've painted the uh, fruit very loosely and put in some of the background here. 
and started to just put some of the loose areas around the clothing here and these roses were going to come down here. So still keeping the style very loose and then I can tighten up at the end. Because I'm going to work my way through here covering the canvas and tightening up to where I want to go and adding patterns in and linking things together. Let me trowel it on with the brush. And it's not even an object in this. You just enjoy the paint. Actually you can get some quite reasonable paints now. Um, paint prices have come right down. As long as you've got a, a student's quality, an artist's quality are all very well, but a good student's quality. You can pick up these lovely big tubes of oil paint now. Quite reasonably. They last me ages. So I go through so much. But not with watercolour. Never buy students quality watercolour. Always artists. That doesn't go anywhere. It's not a saving at all. Watercolour has to be artist quality. This was a very joyous occasion, so we want joyous colours. Joyous handling of the paint as well. The whole thing wants to be alive. So the right colours one to another in approximately the right shapes in the right places. Now we're going to leave that and come across here because there are some white roses amongst these and what I'm going to do there is paint in a mid-tone, a uh, mid-grey by mixing some uh, blue and brown and a little touch of green. Let's just test that. Yes that's a bit chilly there. A little bit darker perhaps so a little bit more blue and a little bit more touch of, of the brown. Don't make it too dark, I might have gone too dark, now let's have a look. No, that should be alright. And then into that we'll place our uh, white, our cream petals, which should give us the effect of a white rose. So for very light blue, I want to see what happens if I can uh, bring a band of colour around down here. So, um, we can start playing with these planes and these shadows a bit more. Let's take a look at that purple we've got there, it's rather nice. It may well be that we want to use a bit more of it in behind this, the feeling of shadow. Blue. So, we'll take some of that blue and that purple, let's warm it a bit. And we'll whack a bit of that in behind here. Just going to get some more patterns design work around this, which gives us a little more three dimension and also enables a bit more pattern for us. Some nice yellows going on over here. I've got to be careful because I'm working up fairly close and you really do need to get back from something like this a bit as well. But uh, coming down here, coming down this, a bit more yellow into this. I, don't, I think actually it's yellow ochre more than lemon yellow, so I'm going to take the yellow ochre and add a little bit of white to it. And let's just see what colour we get then, that's better. Playing against his face, coming down here. Okay, now I've got to stand back a bit from the painting because uh, I'm going to need to work much more loosely up here. But before I do, I was just working on these yellow areas down here. Now we've got some absolutely wonderful colours of the sari up here. I've already marked out some areas that I thought would be rather nice to do. The oranges, orange here. I'm going to be quite abstract up here. Just painting in colours and patterns directly from the saris. I didn't 
and intuitively um, using these patterns as they come down. And then that lady has on her dress for that particular colour. Some rather nice gold markings. Beautiful colours comes into the gold there. Everything always goes according to plan, and this uh, acrylic I did earlier in the garden, painting on plein air, I never was completely happy with it, and just sometimes it's worth working on a painting further. It was an acrylic so I can paint oils over it. You can't put uh, acrylic over oils, but you can put oils over acrylic. So while I still have the oils out for my last painting, I'm going to take two photographs, one of the same scene that I was painting, and one a bit later on, which is a bit more on the left-hand side here, and use those to work further into this painting and pull it together a bit more and clarify it some more. It still seems a bit jumbled to me and needs a bit more detail, a bit more work, which I couldn't do at the time. So let's see what happens when we work a bit more on this painting and see if we can improve it. So the thing is, looking at the uh, photographs, is just how much needs doing. These marigolds will rather nicely go down here and one or two details of these flowers picked out a bit more We'll just, I think, pull this painting together. So we've got a nice foundation to work on. It's very loosely painted, but it just needs to go that stage further, a little bit, little bit more tightly. Let's see what we can do. I'm hoping I'm only going to need three brushes for this. I've got two twos there and a three, all artificial sables, nylon, rounds. And uh, I'm hoping that these will be ideal for just doing the petals straight off. This very fine pointed one more for the stems, but these two, hopefully, will be ideal for the petals. So. Let's see about putting on some pure colours into this and see how it looks. We'll take some chrome yellow immediately and look at some of these marigolds and just see if this thicker oil paint, which is a, a more opaque, heavier colour than the um, pigment than the original acrylic, which was rather thin, I thought. This is one trouble with using cheaper paint is that if you use cheaper paint the, uh, the paint's often slightly thinner. But you can see from this the purity of colour we can get with these oils which is going to brighten up this whole picture. 
and pull it together and I think it will improve it greatly. And into that we can immediately paint some cadmium orange and look how beautifully that brings that out. And already we've got more detail going on than we had before. So I think it's improving it straight away personally, but leaving this lovely loose background. So we'll just use these brushes to paint in the petals all over the place here. painting in single easy strokes to represent these petals. How much brighter these colours are in the oils than these cheaper acrylics. Well now that you know the basics of how this is done, let's see the rest of the film at high speed and see how it develops. This way of painting an acrylic underpainting is one I've used several times before. It's very useful when painting out of doors because it means that you can do an underpainting that dries very very quickly and on the same day, in fact within the same half an hour, immediately start painting with oils on top and doing your final details. Oil paint of course is a wonderful medium, so creamy and rich and you can ladle it on in impasto, which I'm doing here, I'm actually building up the flowers with the brush.
So, one final reminder. We can paint oils over acrylics, but we shouldn't paint acrylics over oils because they're a shiny surface and they won't take it. Well, there you have it. I think the painting's almost finished at this stage, so we'll just paint a few more details and some of the stems, and that'll be it. Some more planes of branches and twigs, stems coming in. And with things like this, with landscapes, I usually like to start with the horizon line as a mid-tone and work my way up. And I do want to pull the colours out quite a bit in this as well, so I'll certainly try and push those colours a bit. I'm going to start with a three-quarter inch nylon flat. At first the colours will seem quite dark on the canvas because all of the canvas is white, so that, that light blue will seem fairly dark at first, but it is a very light cerulean and white. So we've got to have a nice straight line for the horizon line which is important. And a little touch of the cerulean again and this time the smallest touch of a very light violet. And over here I'll reach out. I like to reach out. I like these long handled brushes because I like to reach out to things and be able to see what I'm doing a bit further away because we are painting often in a fairly impressionist technique which does mean that it's better to get back from it to see what you're doing. Right, now we need to work to a slightly warmer creamy white and I don't want to be into a golden yellow yet. I'm going to use the yellow ochre to give me a, a creamy white. So I've made a I've made a yellow ochre and white mix now. Down here there's a bit, yeah. So look carefully at your colours on the photographs and really push them because the photographs won't push the colours unless you do it on the computer. They will tend to be a little bit bland and that light shining down through there, look. 
All right, what have we got there? Let's test that. Yes, that's more like it. Go along the top of that area there and just mix some of that in with and through this lighter. It's surprising how many colours there are there when you really start to look. Right, we've established that colour then. Now we want to actually go a bit stronger with our colours now. So going up here, let's look at some of these lighter greys. I'm going to mix a load of different different greys and colours for this painting. There's quite quite a variety in here. We're still using our, our cerulean and a little bit of rose mix. A fair amount of taps in it to get it to get the bright light into the canvas. A more yellowy yellow ochre mix of it up here. Lovely size canvas to work on. I like working on something a bit larger. This size is not too big, but just nice. Right, now we've got to get stronger with those colours, lighter and darker. Look at the different warms and cools there still. So I'm going to go to some cobalt blue now. Cobalt blue and mix it in the same mix. And add a touch of yellow to it and a touch of rose to it still. And I'm just feathering in, just tickling in. Tickling with the end of the brush in short strokes is, is called feathering in, in art. Feathering in these short strokes of greys. Right, we go stronger still, because now we're going to use some ultramarine and white. And again, a, a warm into it. I'm going to add a little now I've been quite strong, a little burnt sienna now into my ultramarine white to give it a lovely purpley blue grey, but a very dark one still, look at that now. We're going to go darker yet, we haven't finished yet by any means. As you can see now the lighter colours that looked very dark when we first put them on are now not looking so dark, they're now lightened up against these darker colours that I've put on since. Right. And we go darker still. And we take the ultramarine yet again. Same colours. And again a little bit of burnt sienna because we've still got much dark in here. I'm going to use a very strange grey in a minute. I'm going to mix some alizarin and viridian which will give me a also give me a very nice grey. People say, how do you make greys? Well, if you tend to mix the secondary colours, your primaries being the red, yellow, blue, if you start to mix the, the browns and the blues and the greens and the browns, you'll start to get uh, some lovely different greys. They're called the tertiary colours. Your primary, secondary and then tertiary. Getting some depth of that now, you see little strokes just modelling into the clouds. Now my Viridian and um, Alizarin, it's a very interesting colour mix to do and you'd think it'd be awful but actually it does make quite a nice grey. It'll give me either a greeny warm grey or a more, more purple grey so I've got to go carefully on this now. I'm going to get some green into it first because the green is there. Just start tinting in this green grey. Those clouds, especially when we get the greens down below, it'll make more sense because the greens in the um, in the actual grasses and so on will start to link to it, so it'll pull, it'll unite the whole painting together. Anybody looking at the painting probably wouldn't even notice it was a green or if they were looking at the photographs they wouldn't realise but again it's through a lot of experience in painting out of doors as well. I mean I, I don't mind doing studio paintings but I do like to be able to paint from life as much as possible. Now back to our ultramarine. And a little touch of the Lisbon into that. 
can really now start to form one of these darker clouds which are much stronger against the lighter ones. And we've almost got our sky sorted there, just a little bit more of these effects of the little rays of light coming through here and there. Right, I want a little bit more warmth up here, so I'm going to add a slightly more pink, orangey pink. Yes, that's helping it a bit. Need a little bit more pink up there. Amongst these blue greys. You see the difference they're making? They're just blending the painting together now. And that will, when you get the rest of the painting in down below, that will have a lovely effect of distance to it. And there we are, I think. We'll leave the sky at that. We might need to do a little bit more later at the very finish of the painting, but I don't think at this stage we do. Let's look at this cloud area here now before we carry on painting and in more detail <clears throat> you heard me mixing the colours and saw me mixing the colours but let's look back on what we've actually painted here in the cerulean blues and the violets and the various mixtures of greys. Here's a little um, here's a diagram to show you where the colours are that I've mixed and where I've placed them to give you a, a reminder of how we made this quite complicated sky we need to soften some of the clouds slightly so I'm going to just come back in with my brush while it's still clean and just soften in some of these edges that are maybe a bit crude or a little bit too strong. You don't want them to be recognisable brush strokes rather. And this is one of the things that the fan brush was developed for. If you see in these fan brushes um, they were made and very useful for doing blending of cloud colours together to soften the edges. Okay we'll move on now then to this part of the painting and we're going to be using yellow ochre down here again with a little tint of some of the other colours in amongst them, a little touch of the, of the rose perhaps. I want them to be fairly clean and pure. So what have we got here? Nice yellow ochre. People said to me recently what colour do you paint sand? Well I mean it's like saying what colour are trees? Um, there's no one colour to paint sand or to paint trees or to paint a sky. It depends on the type of the country you're in, the type of sand that there is, and, um, and the light effects and everything else that's going on around it. So it's not uh, just one colour. But generally speaking, yellow ochre is good for sand. If you want to go more yellow, so you can start going into the, the chrome or cadmium yellows and so on. But I mean, if the sand's reflecting water, then it'll be a reflection of the sky or the same colour as the water around. So we're going to paint around this drawing <coughs> not too tightly. We're going to have to make some adjustments later. So, uh, into the distance here. It's um, showing quite a light grey. I'm going to go back, mix up some cerulean blue and uh, white and a little touch of the, of the rose later to make a similar colour to the sky because that's what it's reflecting. It's a very slight bit of green going on to that tinting. So I'm going to take a bit of Viridian and yellow ochre, and then a little bit of ultramarine into it here. Very subtle colour changes as the light changes across the horizon. To carefully work a series of horizontal lines along here to get the feeling of this, these bands of wet sand and sea warmer. And we're going to add a little burnt umber down here with a bit of burnt sienna to give a slightly warmer feel to the sand and darker area here. We'll take a little bit of um, cobalt now, make it a bit bluer back there. Okay. 
So these worms come down here. I play with this is yellow ochre and white and a little touch of the burnt sienna, not too much. And the yellow ochre and white to uh, just pick up some of these little bits of light from the clouds. Tiny bits of colour, but very important bits of colour. But to play against the different warm and cool blues again, get the feeling of sea out there. Getting the effect of distance, you see. Here we've got um, a whole line of wheat grasses. I've got to uh, feel my way along there with the warm and cool greens. Just establish where they are. Some quite strange cool and warm greens going on. Yellowy greens that are warm and bluey greens that are cool. And we'll just get the basic shape of the horse in and do a fine drawing at the end. So now we can come back into this and cut back into the shape to get that leg right. And just carefully working the lights against the darks, we should be able to get the drawing of this horse correctly. A green on the back side, reflecting that sky again. Cobalt blue with those trousers, I reckon. Blend that in. And where the light shines just across the top of the trousers there, a little of the burnt sienna mix. And then the face, so go back to the um, burnt sienna on the face, I think. A little touch of blue. Don't need an awful lot. As we get the canvas covered and the white it disappears, you'll be able to see the colours more clearly. Right, well, we've established our sky, we've done the middle distance and distance, now we've got to work to the foreground. And I'm going to do that very rapidly and work in blocks of colour first and then gradually work at my details afterwards. I'm going to use the edge of my three quarter inch flat, starting with fairly warm colours here, so a lot of yellow ochre. Just to put a bit more green into it, just a tint of green into it now as it goes back over here. It's going to go slightly out of focus as I go back there, as it's into the distance. Already you can see from the effect we're going to have, but I'm getting rid of this white. is where we start to change the colour slightly. You see I'm already starting to work into this with well, but Sienna for instance to change these tones slightly as we go along. And more grassy colours here in the foreground as well. So we'll start to work in some of the browns here. A bit of burnt umber and Okay. And it's a slightly stronger grey of blue now. I'm going to my cobalt and again a bit of the yellow worker still. Start to make some stronger greens coming through in the foreground. And I start to paint some thistly shapes as well. 
so the brush is being used to push and go slightly sideways now. And we're giving an impression of these thistles and other plants that are growing. And let's look at some of these stronger greens now. Take some emerald. And we'll just look at how these leaves can be built up. These cool reflecting greens. Now with a smaller brush. And it's the same with the grasses as well. There's uh, some nice blades of grass coming up through here and now we can start to paint in more individual blades. Got this lovely yellow red work going on around here. Now what colours are we going to use for that? Well we'll start with our lightest one in fact and get on a, a pure lemon yellow I think if I can get it to go on without it. So just by blobs of colour we can give the effect of these flowers and plants not having to paint in detail. So traditional landscape, beachscape, <coughs> with traditional techniques, figurative painting. But when we say figurative painting, it's always that element of abstract in the figurative, isn't there? It has to be these colours, the way we're placing them and the textures. You know, if we enlarge any part of this, they would be quite an abstract painting. And now you see these golden yellow sands in the background. You wouldn't paint sand with this sort of yellow. They are a golden yellow, the sands, so probably use the yellow ochre. And now we're using this pure cadmium chromes and lemon yellows for the, for the flowers, which are that warm, bright yellow. And if we'd used the wrong yellow in the first place, these just would not have worked. I want to go slightly warmer yet, so I'm going to go down to my cadmium orange yet. And some, what, just a few oranges amongst there to really make some of these colours colours sing a bit more. Okay, let's have a look at some of these thistles now. Um, pink thistles. And you want to paint the light areas first on these, and then go underneath them with the darks. Now, what colour are they? Well, I'm going to take a very light violet at first because they're not going to just be one colour, they're going to be probably two or three colours. If we start those off, this is why it's so important to look at your individual colours as you go along and compare and make sure you're getting the right colours in the right places because you know one colour affects another and the cools of these are going to affect the warms of the... Um... How about these warms? Well, Let's try it with the rose first. I should go darker and warmer yet. I haven't finished yet by any means. I'm still building these up. And for composition we could do with a, a flower or something happening here really. About there, yeah. And maybe here. We've got to think about the thing abstractly still. And it still is an abstract painting so we've got to still look to where these colours are coming. Now let's take some different all together and just see what we get with that. Because of the thistle heads, which we haven't got yet. Now let's have a look at these thistle heads. Make some, we'll take some light red, so we'll take some Indian red now. Just see what that does. And that pulls it back together because they were standing out almost too much there. I don't want them to look like a sore thumb. Some of the little bits of grass we can flick in with that. And that might seem fairly yellow, but we know again what it is. Let's have a look at some of these little bits of grasses. We'll start flicking in some grass tips. You see the tip of the brush and look at the grass seed growing. Different directions, vary the directions of them. Wind's blown them over, they're 
I'm going to all be dead straight. Right, coming off the edge of the canvas, don't, don't make a border down the bottom of the canvas to, to follow right up and through and make the warm seem warm because this is a very cool, this is my Viridian Green now, used pure and there's very few times when you can use either pure Viridian or Elizabeth Crimson. You've got to really have built up your painting to the very end before you think you could actually have a strong enough colour like this to put on. And I could go darker yet because I've still got my Prussian blue to use if I wish to, which is even darker. It's, it's, it's our deepest of the greens. It's the deepest of the blues, beg your pardon. Greens, talking about. Okay, I'm going to change to my one of my longer thin brushes and I think we need to whip in a little bit of the paint carefully in uh, a few of the lighter coloured leaves on the thistles. Just the three dimensional effect that we're after. So to go back and get some cerulean blue and some white because that's in the sky and the sea and I've got a pretty good idea having painted outdoors so many times that some of that is going to be reflecting on the leaves. The talking of that is actually going on quite a bit in the background there. So I'm going to bring some of that down through into here to link that together, to pull that together.
We're back from Scotland now and uh, we've done or attempted to do a couple of on-plane air works even with the bad weather. What I'd like to do now quite separately from that film is a studio piece, one of the favourite shots that I took there. Beautiful photograph over that research lock up in Abundant. And I'm going to do this in both acrylics and oils. Uh, start off with acrylics just to build the basic up and try and be a little bit more figurative, a little bit more realistic with this particular piece. A composite where I'm going to use the photograph and Again, to be a little bit more commercial, perhaps bring a few grouse coming through to give that real feeling of Scotland and the wildlife that's there. So let's enjoy doing that in, uh, in close-ups to see the brushwork as well and look at the techniques of doing a slightly more photographic piece of uh, representational work. Well, I've set out my old paints here and a few acrylics just to make a start on the sky and reflections. I'm only going to need white, yellow ochre, black, a little touch of ultramarine and some burnt sienna for this. And then I've got my uh, fairly full palette of oils, although I shan't need all of those colours. The board that I'm painting on is um, a board that uh, I had in Scotland with me and I found that the acrylics were resisting it. So it'd be interesting today to see how that acrylic takes to it a bit thicker. It'll be alright for the oils, I'm sure. Um, of course, we're going to do this picture and then add the birds at the end. So I want to do these, I want to do these um, subtle greys first, which are a touch bluer than I have here. First thing to do is a nice big brush to fill that. And when we're mixing a light colour, remember to mix the lighter colour first. In other words, we mix the, the white and then the colour into it. If you don't do it that way around, you end up with a gallon of paint and you don't want too much. I'm going to work from my darker greys up towards my lighter greys. So in this case I've got to add a little bit of blue. So say do it this way around, you end up with far too much paint. My subtle darker bluey greys, so a little bit of blue. Blue and brown gives you a grey anyway. A little bit of the brown. So I may not need much black at all. Uh, there we are, we're getting the colours we want. A little bit more blue. Nice intermediate grey. and will try that out. I haven't drawn out the composition at all. Um, I'm going to work fairly intuitively onto this. I know that the horizon line starts slightly below halfway and uh, comes up to about just a bit above here. So what I want to do is just mark it in. I've got this nice light blue-grey base that I want to put into here and through. We've got some wonderful effects to have to do into this later, but at the moment I just want to get rid of the black because I want to work my oils over this. And the dark, the black, will be fine for glowing through the darker background later on. So I'm painting it fairly thickly as you can see because I want to cover up this black and in this case these paints are covering it quite well. The other acrylics I was using earlier were resisting this terribly and I just gave up. I just went straight onto a different canvas. So I'm mixing up my slightly darker greys with the various warms and cools because it's uh, some lovely colours going on into here. You see, by the use of more brown or more blue, I can make a more blue or brown grey. Don't use black and white normally, it makes things very sooty. Black is a very sooty colour to mix. The impression is banded all together from their palettes. So I'll go a bit darker still. A lovely subtle greys we can get this way. And so I want to work up my, my deeper greys first. It'll dry pretty quickly on this board, so I'll be able to work coats over it. You can see how I'm using the brush at a very slight tilt, not, not straight on and not flat on, but just about three quarters here uh, to, in different directions to brush this colour. That's so quite warmer, it's a bit warmer up here. Look at these variations of blue browns, greys. Before I bring the lighter colours over the top in a minute, just little strokes, quite big strokes actually with this brush, it's a, it's a three quarter inch filbert, a nice nylon filbert. We can get these lovely variations of warm and cool grey this way. Just letting one come over the other. Now the tip of the brush a bit more, and I'm just blending it in across the other colours. 
And if we're really successful with this, we're going to even need the oil on it. We'll just say, well, that's made it and that's it. So I've got quite a warm grey there at the moment. Now a little touch more blue into there, make it a slightly bluer grey. You see the warm grey that we had earlier. Now I want to come in a bit, bit bluer with it to here. This nice chunky, yet still subtle and soft clouds. So I'm molded up into the sky. I should build them up. The thing with acrylic is, as it dries so quickly, is you. You can't blend afterwards, it's very difficult. So I like to try and get it done while it's still fairly wet. So we can bring those colours down below. I'm not using much water at all because I want the paint to cover this dark prime board I've already done in acrylic. Work our way across now and add a little more a slightly warmer but lighter grey and work into it. We may work over it several times building up these colours. So I want to get a really subtle effect of, of the clouds. I'm going to be fairly photographic this time. And work our way right the way across the painting. And as we've got a coat of paint on, I can add more water now to my paint and start to use a few more glazes. I can use the paint more thinly, in other words, to paint it transparently across the surface more. Mixing up some more uh, ultramarine and uh, burnt sienna, just a little. It gives me an in-between in grey, a, not a cool or a warm, it's the use of both and if I want to go cooler or warmer then all I have to do is add more of the blue. I'm not using black at all. I thought I really need to but I'm just going to use this variations of the greys and I'm going to then come on with a little bit of yellow ochre and white to start bringing up the whites, the lights of the clouds. You see how I change my brush stroke as I come around feeling underneath the clouds as well. And it's like different opposites. If we play rough against smooth, warm against cool, light against dark, then the opposite of each of those will be enhanced. So if I put the opposites in the colour circle together in just the same way they would be, and a bit more water than that, and I can start to just glaze it a bit. And more water still. You can feel these clouds coming over the surface of the paint and just feather them in, feathering being this tickling motion of the brush. Use more water to blend it and one glaze after another just gradually building it up. We can do this with oils and in some way with oils it's easier because they stay soft but we don't glaze as easily with oils. In this case we're glazing. The oils would be putting the surface, putting, mixing the paint um, one into another rather than just glazing over the surface because it takes ages for it to dry. Now it's time to start looking at the lighter colours that I want to put. So I'm going to start mixing some yellow ochre and white. So these are previous greys, just using the blue and the brown. Now a little bit of, a little touch of yellow ochre, it doesn't take much. We don't need lemon yellow, yellow ochre is plenty yellow enough. I don't want it too light either. Gradually build up the lights, and you see how strong that is compared to the other grey. I want to start to find these lighter colours in the sky. I'm going to need to blend these a bit, so I don't want it to be too... With this royal I'd be just subtly bringing this in now, but it's not, it's acrylic, so it's going to be a slightly sharper edge. I may even use the oils over the top yet to come back into it. I just want to find these lighter bits of warm cloud, which again will play against, let's use it with plenty of water, which will play against the uh, cools and warms of the greys. Just subtly blending the colours in, feeling the light coming through these clouds. And keep your brush going in different directions, feeling the light, feeling the shapes of the light as it comes through. 
give us a beautiful transparency to this uh, Highland cloud that's always such a nuisance actually at the time. It was so wet I couldn't, we just couldn't get going. And gradually let our lights come out. So we're starting with the darker parts of the cloud and gradually finishing up with the with these lighter bits. Just tickle. That's why it's important to have a brush that's good for the purpose. This one is too stiff for watercolour, but it is very nice for acrylics or oils. You can try and feel the flow of those clouds coming around there, swirling a bit. And then they can go a bit cooler in places as well. And then I want to come back finally with an ever such light mix of the yellow ochre and white just to get these last fluffy bits of light cloud shining in here. Having got that we need to move down to the water. We're going to use the same sorts of colours because obviously the colours are reflecting in the water. So let's mix up our, our mid greys again and get this basically coloured for the moment just to you see how that's trying to resist me then. And one of the tricks with water is to paint the verticals first, to paint the depth of the water first, to paint the reflections into that depth and feel the darks within the depth. And then bring the surface ripples, lights and uh, sheens across the top at the end. Now they can't do that as easily with watercolour because watercolour demands that we paint the leave the lights first. But with this way of painting we can. We're going to paint very light details over the top in, in uh, with a finer brush later as well. So I'm mixing up some quite strong colours here now, quite strong greys, just to give me the base coat to bring the other light colours through in more detail as we go on. And a bit more warmth to the sky as well by putting a very thin glaze of yellow ochre and sienna over it. And of course back down to our greys here, which we were originally mixing. So then if all our brush strokes are horizontal, we start to feel the depth of the water as I was saying. And let those reflections shine through. As compared to the sky, which are quite different marks, more fluffy and cloud-like. And as this ripple, as the water has a slight ripple on it, we want to get that effect of the ripple. And we'll work over this over and over again, across and downwards. You can see how I'm using the brush vertically, the tip of the brush now, not the flat, the tip of it far more. Vertically more than horizontally and flatly. And the warmth of these silver greys against the warmer greys. Just starting to play with the ripples in the water now. Just flicking with the tip of my brush, just flicking across the top. This is one of the beauties of the filbert brushes is that we've got a flat and a narrow edge to it. A little bit more water means that on my brush means that I can start to do these little ripples coming through. I could do this with a finer brush but I don't really need to. I can use this brush to the effect of these ripples down here and I shall come back again with a darker colour in a moment. That's the beauty of acrylics is that we can play with. These glazes. You can see I work across the canvas and then down into it as well like that. board I should say in this case. Let's go back to our darker greys, mix up some darker ones again. It's actually it's quite dark in places. Darker than I'm getting now in fact still. There's play between the horizontal and the vertical and the reflections. Gently dragging dry brush across the surface there to get a little bit of blending of the dark and warm over the surface of the water, not too much. You're going to have some Grasses across that the so the leaves through there. So won't matter too much there. But there's a darker area up here, which is quite important, of horizontal. So use the edge of the brush now to drag round down through there a bit more. Gradually building up these darks still. 
almost enough. This is our, our basic ground for the uh, for the painting. We've got the details to add in afterwards, which I'll probably do more with the oils. So I've got my ground there. Now I want to look at the um, the darker areas of the mountains and hills here, starting with a very pale purple almost. I don't want to be using too much of my acrylics on this because I do want to come back to the oils more for these more subtle colours. I'll just mark up where things are going. Just starting to paint some of the highlights into bushes and trees here. Having done my duller colours I'm now starting to bring in little tickles of these greens to catch the sunlight over the tops of the trees here. Very finely. I've got to bring the dark branches over the front later on. Sunshine across the tips of the trees. What we're attempting to do now is start to bring out these much lighter background. A little bit of lemon yellow now, just to, just the beginning of it just to start to feel some of this a little bit of white into that as well just to get a bit more body to go into the background and we'll start to try and find these layers of light coloured trees picking up the sunlight behind here now it's quite golden so I'm going to take some chrome yellow and see what that does and these colours should help to push back cools in the background. I think you can see what I mean. Even down into a bit of pure cobalt blue here now to try and get the feeling of the cool against the... It's coming up into the head itself, of course. Of course. Now we'll start using this light green to look at the surface of the water. So we've got most of our sunlight going on here now starting to build up the much stronger, warmer colours into the foreground. So to cool that down just a bit, I'll put a bit of cerulean blue back into that with some white. And just cool that right back so we get the warmth amongst these cool leaves. Otherwise I'll be standing up too much and I must be three-dimensional into the air. That sort of colour, you see the... It's not just one colour all the time that makes the thing work. It can be one colour against another very often. If anything, we need a little bit of warm against that as well. So we're going to need a bit of chrome yellow. Just a touch of white amongst these. Just one or two yellowy bits to make the green seem greener. And catch that sunlight. Now we need to start looking at these darks and branches. Um, the dark we want for the foreground is going to be Prussian blue and a bit of uh, umber again. Probably raw umber because it's cooler. And with this, to get the right consistency, we've got to have just the right consistency of paint. In other words, just enough turps to help it to flow. And I'm going to start with a larger brush. Let's see, that's uh, halfway there, it's a quarter of the way there, halfway, quarter, just inside here. And that comes down. And all the way to just below the half, which is about here. Just mark it out first, up to here, and then it's going to come all the way through and round and down and into there like that. So it's fairly warm. And it's fairly thick. That sort of thickness, and we've got to go from thin, I mean, to thick. We can't go thick, thin, thick, thin. We've got to keep it gradually growing through here. Now we want something a bit warmer. I may even have to come down to a purple, but I'm going to use some burnt sienna now. Come warm through there. Push that cool back. A bit of ultramarine now. It comes down cool through this bit. You may have to wait till the paint dries a bit to really get this right, but 
There we go. Take a bit of purple. Put that purple in there. That will give me the dark I want. And the luminosity. We should go down to a smaller brush later, but just for the moment. Not a quick. And just enough terps on your brush, not too much, make it too thin, but enough to let it flow. I'm using, still using a filbert to make these main branches. Like talking of smaller brushes, let's try a little round. It's going to be a cheapie I brought the other day, but let's see if it works. Sometimes these, usually these cheapies are horrible, but this one actually doesn't look too bad. Give it a go, shall we? Again, it's getting the paint mix right. Looks to be okay, let's find out. Hmm, that's not too bad. We can do our little twigs and things with that. As I say, this painting is going to be full of detail, which is not something I don't normally do, but if I'm going to show you how, I might as well do it properly. Explain everything while I'm going on. I'm going to grow the leaves on the twigs afterwards. Grow my twigs first and then grow the leaves later. I've got to go ever so thin. I may even have to use a rigger or one little single point brush or something because these these twigs are very very thin coming down here. And I'm making the point of the brush into a blade each time I put paint on. It's not just the point of the brush, I'm flattening it out against, as you see here, there's the blade, against the palette each time to give myself a much thinner edge. A little trick for getting fine brushwork. Those of you that said I can't paint photographically, well, if I want to, I can. But it, again, it's the same as you, it's your choice. You, you do what you want to do. I, I don't normally because I like to be more alive and loose. But it's fun occasionally to have a little challenge like this. Well, that's one thing about a cheap brush. The end just fell off into the turps, having got my brush back again. Go back to... Uh, the details on this and it's time to actually start putting some of these little leaves in and I'm going to again do the mid-tones and darks first almost painting leaf by leaf these little mountain ash first of all let the brush make the pattern it's going to build up bit by bit by bit by bit by bit you start to get the effect now as, as I'm doing this, you start to see how it's working. But it's going to take a lot of texturing. I might use a sponge in a minute to get all this lot done here. Because there's far too much to do just with a brush really. Right, take a break and we'll find the right sponge. Okay, our next job is to mix enough paint just to uh, use with the sponge. I've got a piece of sponge here that should do the job for doing this um, textural work here. Don't use uh, a fine brush for it. I'm going to use some burnt sienna, I'm going to use some raw umber, some ultramarine and some Prussian, a little bit of purple just to give it a really dark colour, maybe even a little touch of the viridian just to get a bit more green into it, there we go, let's try that, squeeze the brush out, leave it there, now with a bit of luck if I just use my sponge to dabble in the edge there I should be able to get a nice texture you see. Now the thing with sponging or anything like this is not to press too hard and also not to overdo it. You see we can get a very nice effect for the leaves, but um, maybe a little bit small actually on this one. I may have to go to a slightly larger sponge. I'm going to use the sponge on the slightly smaller leaves here. I may 
you want to put some large ones on later, but I'll just get... Now always twist the sponge, otherwise you'll get a pattern rather than a picture about leaves. And it looks as if you spent hours and hours doing it, but you can see from what I'm doing it's not. It's very technique-y, a bit slick. But if it does the job, and we do it properly, it should still look quite professional. I'm going to get some larger sponge in a minute and do some larger leaves. And you can always drag the sponge slightly too if you want. So now I'm going to need some larger leaves, so I'm going to want some slightly heavy, more textural sponge, I'm a feeling. I can find it amongst my bits of sponges. But already we've, we're well into this tree. Now what I'm going to do now is mix up a whole lot more. Some of this I think I'm going to do with the brush as well. We can even start to use it onto the piece of heather down here by just pulling it a bit and twisting it round to get the effects of leaves. Okay, and it makes it look as if we've done lots and lots and lots of work. Actually, it's very simple. And we can do this with the lighter colours when it's dry as well. There we are, so we'll let that dry off next. Well, as you can see now that the texture of paint we've done is, is dried fairly well overnight. Being on board, it silks it in. This is MDF, heavy MDF. Um, and we were doing the sponge work here for the leaves using these two sponges so we've got different textures slightly here, finer and slightly thicker and now we want to build up these lighter areas of the leaves and textures which I'll show you by just zooming in on the part so you can see how it's done we're going to be mixing some lighter greens so we need these mid greens first of all and then the very light ones there are two different light colours here we can do and to do that I'm going to be using these three here the emerald, the yellow green and we'll possibly be using a bit of light blue later on as well on the surface so again, start with one of your larger brushes to mix. You've got plenty of it. And we're at a fairly mid-green in this case, so we'll take some Viridian and some Emerald. And a little touch of yellow over just to take it back a little bit, make it warm. And that should do it. Maybe, maybe a wee touch of lemon yellow just to, just to give it a bit more yellowness. There we are, that's a nice colour. Now if I take that with my fine sponge. You can see how it's at the end now, the texture's there for the leaves. See here how the uh, texture went on before. We did the fine work, remember the twigs with the little round brush. Then we use the, the sponge to do the darker areas. Now we just want to start putting on these little bits of sunlight that are catching on the surface look, like this. This is our mid-green tone, going over the darker green. We'll get some highlights of the much lighter green as well. Twist the sponge around so that it doesn't make a pattern, so that you're actually getting the effect of the leaves. And you can see when we go over a dark area here, how nicely it shows how these leaves textures pick up. Coming out onto the actual sunlight here. All the way down. So that's how we're going to build up now the, the lighter areas of leaves. Now we need some much larger leaves, so I'm using a bit heavier sponge, a bit darker and warmer here in the foreground, so a little leaves in the background there, but we need some larger ones to come forward here. And as I say, if we, put, if we put warm against cool, light against dark, rough against smooth, it will enhance each of those as we go along. We have to come back in with the brush and do some of the leaves, but uh, most of it can be done with these textures. I do some very, very light leaves reflecting the light. Green this time using the emerald and a little bit of white. And I'll add some uh, yellow to that later on to make it even lighter. You see how we just pick out some of the 
very light highlights coming down from the sky. So you move the sponge around to twist it to get it to, to give you an uneven pattern. You don't want penny yard as they say, in other words ribbon. Uh, it's got to be looking as if it's an individual touch all the time. You'd get back from it as well and be able to see it. So don't get up too close to your work all the time. Do stand back and have a little look. Right, I need to put some yellow into that now. So there's my colour. Take a little bit of lemon yellow and mix that in with it. And a bit of white again to keep it very light. And we end up with a slightly warmer, nice leafy colour look. Take it onto the sponge and we'll see if we can add that to it. There we are. That's going to give it a little more brightness again, spontaneity. Remember what we're trying to do now is actually paint direct sunlight onto our picture. We're actually taking these little pieces of, of sunlight and placing them in as highlights to catch the light at the ends of the little twigs and branches in this lovely reflected Okay, now we've done the uh, technique bit with the sponges, let's come back to the brushes. I'm going to take this bit of Prussian, some of the dark mix we did earlier as well, and make my brush back into a blade again. And just look at these little areas like this where there may be just too much. But also, we're going to have to put in the little light leaves where they're required. Now, in this case, we want a little more chrome, more of the orangey greens nice and clean as actual leaves this time so they look quite different to the marks of uh, the sponge. I do love sunlight, I have a job to live without it, this is why I miss France. I, it does my arthritis good to have a bit of warmth and light as well. I think I suffer from sad syndrome at times, in other words I need the sunlight. Light and colour to keep me cheerful and happy. As I was saying earlier about the rough against the smooth, the light against the dark, the cool against the warm, these larger leaves that I'm putting in now will enhance the smaller leaves. We're almost ready now to be looking at the uh, warmer colours of the heathers. I'm talking of warmer colours, let's start looking at a few of those even in these branches here. And these little bits of red are very important because they're going to make things leap forward, they're going to come into the foreground of our picture, they're going to bring the eye, the colours forward and push the cools back. Now that very very light pink I was talking about, um, we've also got some of that happening on the twigs. So I need to make a very very light colour and again I've got to have just the amount of, the right amount of uh, taps on my brush to do this job. We need some very lights coming down through these twigs here, catching the sunlight. So I'm making my brush into a blade again and just finding where these little bits of light come down across the Works here. The light's coming from the left, it seems, so my little lines need to be on the left as well. Lots of lovely detail in it. These little bits of light are coming down into other areas too. I think we're ready now for doing the heather. I'm going to need to mix these colours up. Again, I can do some with brush and I can do some with uh, texturing. Now for this heather, these lovely pinks and so on, we've got our roses and cadmiums and purples to play with and some of that's going to be uh, have a little cream added to it as well. So let's just start mixing those up. I'll take my medium brush 
and we want to start with our body colour which is white because we want things to be fairly light on this so I'll take some white we need to keep this fairly clean let's start then with um, our darkest of these some of our darkest there's, some, there's some, such a lovely variety of colours here isn't there we've got the ordinary reds we've got pinks so we'll add a little bit of red to that white that's quite a warm red and in, remember that in every colour that we use there's a warm and a cool of it so if it's a red there can be a, a warm orangey red or it could be a cooler more rose red like this one for instance now look I'm going straight across to my rose without even cleaning the brush I'm making a more rose we can go stronger and stronger with that but it is just almost entirely rose we can go into more purple with it let's dip that into the white there just to show you what we can do and a more cooler of the reds rose so now we've got the very orangey ones down towards a more cooler we can take a more purple still you see the difference in those from cool round to warm so that just gives you an idea even with those colours what we can do now if I want to go warmer still I could take that cadmium and put a little bit of orange with it and go even more orangey and I could go warmer still there by adding more yellow to it and becoming much more yellow put more white in there and now you can see all of this range of, of these colours here happening down in our palette so by using my sponge and these various colours right through to the pure red straight off the palette right, just for the moment to give you an idea let's look at this area here take a little bit of my sponge fairly fine bit at the moment and we'll look at a cooler red for a start and start to put those bits of heather in how beautifully they show little highlights coming through and we'll move to a slightly lighter one right through here we'll take a little bit of white and mix it in with it actually on the palette back into that we get these lovely heather effects very simply done and it looks like we spent hours and hours doing it but we know we haven't you know I haven't you've been watching what I've been up to cheating back to the pinks again down here and let's put some actual almost pure color on there now let's take some of the rose and back into the background here and that gives you an idea, I'll just carry on like that don't overdo it, just find your colours but I'm not just pressing, I'm dragging slightly at the same time on many of these just to get a slight feeling of the bristles of the the twig-like structures of the, uh, the heathers as well. I'm going straight onto my palette now to take the reds off. I've done my mixing, so I'm starting to use more pure colour. Right up to these flame reds. Wonderful flame reds here. God knows what it is, but uh, some of those colours, you'd almost think they've been planted in the garden, they're so lovely. And how they leap out at us in the front, in the foreground here. Now I'm actually going back to some ultramarine and some cobalt, because we need to play the cools against the warm still. So I'm going to bring in the texturing of the, the blues and the cools into here as well. I mustn't forget they still exist. They will help to make the warm seem warmer. And we come with areas of blue into this as well which also links with the blues in the background so that we have colours coming through everything lots of lovely texture then 
in many ways, I've almost finished this painting, um, but I've got more uh, animals and things I want to put into it. I want to put some grass into it yet. Um, but I want to finish off here now, not with the uh, sponge, but with my brush, finally. I want the brush strokes to be slightly different as well, and this is another reason I'm not just, uh, I'm saying it a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I do want to uh, make it look as if uh, it's not just sponge work textures, but just as I want them in a different way. I've got a lovely abstract quality to this area now. I'm going to go back to some of the ordinary gold to link with the background. Now I'm putting in a bit of yellow ochre. Just ordinary yellow ochre, not chrome yellow or anything fancy, just to link with some of our yellow ochres in the background. Really get this effect of sunlight. So we're coming to the end of just how uh, painting the background, the basics. Blodgy, so we just have to do a bit more work in it. Bring it back again. More texture there, here and there. Right, next is to. Uh, Look at how to paint the birds in. We would like some grabs, I would like some grabs in there. So I think what we may do now is play on the computer a bit, but let's take a closer look at the painting before we go on. The sorts of texture that we've now created. I feel the background is, is almost done. Um, I say almost because I'd like to bring out a highlight, I think. Um, what I haven't done here is uh, used a cream using lemon yellow. Now we've used the yellow ochre, which is fine, and we can normally get away with that with this guy. But I think it would be nice to uh, just try a slightly lighter cream. So I need to mix a little bit of white with <clears throat> a touch of lemon yellow. Take a little bit more light across those clouds coming up through here. One of the reasons I want to do that is because um, I'd like to put a bit more light shining across the water as well. Now, having got that, we need to reflect that slightly here in the water, I think. And some slightly lighter bits of this cream amongst these bits of heather as well. Right, I think it's time we look now at the uh, birds, if I'm going to put them in. And the first thing is to decide just where they're going. And uh, for that I'll mix up a little bit of dark. Just a little bit of um, burnt umber and ultramarine. Very thinly to draw with. So I can get rid of it if I have to. Now I want to be dividing the painting up into quarters. <coughs> so halfway, quarter, just about right there. Alright, that's mapped out where I want the birds to go. Now we've got to paint them in in more detail. <coughs> now the way I'm going to paint these, save the small brush to the end again, is to block in my mid-tones first. And the whole of the uh, the grass here, this area can be painted mainly in a very deep purple brown. I think we'll get away with Indian red. I'm going to add a little bit of rose to that. Might be two strange colours to use, but it'll give me a very rich, deep, orangey, purpley red there. 
And I'm going to paint darker into that to give it a glow. There's a lighter area going on there. This comes right up under the wing here. Around and under there. I'm going to just let that dry on there and give me a nice glow to the that purple. And I'm going to add blue into that in a minute to really Right, coming around there to really give it some life. Right now I want to come up into the head here. A bit of warmth into that bit of wing there. While I've got that colour on my brush, I want it somewhere else. I need it across here on this bird. And this very warm colour will also help to bring these birds forward into the picture hoping to give them almost a three-dimensional look. Give this picture much more depth. Not that it hasn't got enough, but it'll give it even more. Round it to there. Some of that warmth coming into this bit of wing as well. Don't want too much back there, be careful. I'll just sharpen it up again in a minute. In fact, I'll try and lift that off now. I just don't want that staining there. There we go. So we can use it almost like watercolour and lift it off with the turps. But it's acrylic underneath, you see. It's squarish across the head. Now, just a bit bluer up there. Take some cerulean blue. Even the smallest of marks now that are wrong can mess things up, so I've got to remove anything that isn't quite right. So we've done some darks, but we can go darker yet. A bit more terps. I've got to get this, because I'm doing very fine work now, I have to have it just the right consistency. I might have to go a little bit lighter in between later to make that stand out a bit more. So we're going to carry on with this uh, bird now, and we'll work in some of the lighter colours now. Let's go towards this very light almost pink. It's coming into the wing just down here. It's nice that because this is acrylic and dry, although there's a bit of oil over it, I can rest my hand actually on here. I should make this a bit lighter in a moment. I'm just doing the first coats for the minute. Just tickling in these feathers. Just get this feathery feel by flicking the brush around here. Right along the edge, front edge of the wing. Quite important. Catching that sunlight as well, which is important. I'm able to rest my finger against the painting here at the minute just to get these lighter details done. And while I've got that on my brush, I look at the little bits of light reflected on the same over here. And this is where my arm starts to hurt because I can't keep it up for this long with the arthritis. And uh, I'm able to rest against the painting, but I would have to use my other hand to hold this arm up otherwise. So it's limited the amount of time I can actually paint and keep my arms up. And that bird is almost there as simply as that. <coughs> well, I've a little bit of green to it yet. Same stronger blue to come into here now. Now, we need some of the warmer colours. I've got to come back to this gold. And I'm going to start again with the yellow ochre, but very quickly come back to now a bit of cadmium orange. Let's see what that can do. A little bit of cadmium orange and cadmium yellow just to make it a bit lighter because we've got this beautiful jewel like quality here. I want nice fresh paint for this. Little strokes of colour which gives it that warmth to start dragging it forward. Now a little bit more of the yellow. A little bit of green now. And it's little things like this that can make your painting. As an impressionist I'm used to looking for these sorts of colours so it's possibly a fraction easier for me in that way. And I can lift away paint so I can get a slightly more feathery effect here of that bird. 
by lifting away some of this paint and just cutting into these edges some turps on the brush. Now it's like a darker cream. And between the feathers here where it's showing a bit transparent. Back up here again, and we'll just try and find this brighter orange. A bit of flame going on up there, the sunlight across the bird. To really try and just capture this effect of light. And you know those birds are almost there, aren't they? This needs to be softened. A little bit of taps on the brush again. And we'd like to look at this tail feather here. Well, I think we're about there with that. Um, don't want to make that too much brighter. Is our finished work then? Now with this painting, um, we've got the wonderful little steam train here that I've made a composite of. I've taken this section and a few more pieces to put together to make what I want for making an exciting little picture of this little uh, tank engine coming in that we had this wonderful trip of we've just seen. So let's see if we can make a quite exciting picture painting in oils. Very rapidly, but we're going to build up in layers. We're going to build up the undercoats first and then build up the details and textures over the top. Right, I've drawn out the basic drawing here, ready to go, and um, we'll be using my usual set of paints. Other paints here, I've got one old plastic palette, I clean this occasionally with some paint stripper, a little bit of turps, just a few brushes just to build up my base coats, and a set of oils over that with nearly all the colours I could possibly need. What I've got to do first is block in these undercolours. The grey is going to be fairly easy to do later, but I need to get the basics of the train in um, and paint out all the white as much as possible just to get the base colours to get the details over because this wants to be a, a fairly illustrative painting. So I need to paint in most of the under, most of the main colours that are underlying these in sections. A little bit like painting by numbers in a way. I'm going to take a fairly small brush, a fill bit at the moment, and we'll just start to make these various colours. Now this shiny tank top here is reflecting the greys of the sky a bit, so we'll have to understand what colour that's going to be before we can even paint that. Then we've got these very dull green greys here working into the blues. Now they're not easy to make some of these colours, uh, we've got to, they're not just bright greens by any means. We will take a little touch of viridian and a wee bit of yellow ochre. Just to give myself a fairly strong green to start with. Into that I'm going to put a little bit of cobalt blue just to find my way. Make it a bit bluer. And we're getting fairly near to it now, as you can see there. Let's just place a bit of that on there and try it out. Yes, that's not far out, look. So, by experience, you'll soon get to learn what colours will help to make what. What I want to do is get a nice even coating onto this back of this tank engine to get rid of all of the white. There will be slight variations in colour and I'm going to leave odd little bits here and there just showing where I know more details got to go because I don't want to paint out all my drawing at the moment. I'd rather sit to do all this lovely drawing and then just waste it, wouldn't it? Right down the side of that tank engine. Not need too sharp a line at the moment but I will 
gradually tidy this up as I go along. All I want to do at the moment is get rid of the whites and establish these main body colours. Not a lot of difference coming across here. Need a fair bit of paint, so I'm going to have to mix up quite a bit. So viridian, yellow ochre to make it a bit more yellow, and a wee touch of cobalt blue to bring it back into this sort of deep bluey green. And cover the surface of the canvas. A bit more blue in that case. In fact, that more yellowy green is going on this side. So I will bring, well, I've got it on my brush, I'll bring that in there. Right down to here. Just a slightly more yellowy green coming down there. There's an awful lot of detail to do in this painting. It's going to take quite a while. It could be done as an impressionist work, but um, we'll get the looser work done later. I want to concentrate on the details here at first. So block in the background and then concentrate into the details. Now let's get the bit more blue into that, a bit more cobalt blue. The background here of the engine around that lamp. That quite light creamy lamp because it won't be pure white because of light shining on it from the sky. So we'll cut into the shape just slightly. Don't try and leave a halo around things. Do cut into them so that uh, when you go to paint the actual thing it works over the other paint. Right there's our slightly lighter green coming down here. I'll get it a bit more even. It might even need two coats. I do want a fairly realistic and photographic effect. There we go. Then that same blowy green coming down here. Right down and through. All the way along there, in fact. Here. So if you want to try painting this, you're always welcome to use my designs if you're an amateur and you just want to uh, learn to paint and enjoy. You can use my photographs or my paintings and copy them by any means or use them to paint from and change them to your own. I'm not jealous in that way, just as long as they aren't used commercially. Could I have a job enough selling them? What are you doing, dog? Check out my paint, stop it. Now up, up here, this bit's much bluer. I'm going to take a little bit of cerulean blue and add into that. That might seem a very strong blue to you. Look at the difference it makes. It's a beautiful blue, look. Add it into that green. Not the colour you'd expect, but I'm used to really looking for colours. Right up into them, put a shadow in there in a moment. Curve that goes on through to the edge here into there and that comes right the way through here in fact down into here I'm going to leave a very slight line there because I know that there's some bars coming across there salt shortly and there we see the slight subtlety and difference in those three different bluey greens blue come into this bit as well. Look at these subtleties and changes of colours. Now, that same blue is coming in a line down here. It's like this shiny, slightly lighter blue in fact, will be slightly lighter in a moment. Just want to bring it down here first of all. 
we get the shininess of the effect of this tank engine being round now by painting these reflections as they come downward. Now I'm going to add some white to that and go to quite a light bluey green just here, places, up into the tank itself here. Before I go to pinky greys and the sky reflecting on here. There we go. And just away bottom of that there. And a little bit of that light blue green coming along the decking of the edge of the train here, engine. Even down this edge a fraction. You see these colours are on your brush, use them. And around the edge there too. Darker green I want up here, let's go back to that. So wash my brush. I've got some cloth nearby to rub it on, to clean it off. And I want to go to a much deeper blue-green. So I'm going to take some Prussian now. A bit of Prussian into that same green that I was working before. Just come up and around here and look how much darker that is. And it's by painting the opposites together. It's by painting warms next to darks, cools next to warms, roughs next to smooths, that we're going to get the colours working as they should individually. On their own, just painted on, they won't work, but painted relevant one to another. So the right shapes, painted in the right places, with the right colours and tones, relevant one to another, will gradually make a painting come out like a jigsaw. See how we're getting that here. Well, we've got these dark colours going. Let's take some more of that and a bit of um, ultramarine blue and make a very dark. And I'm going to add a little bit of warm to it. This so I'm going to take a little bit of of, um, of burnt umber and add that to my very deep blue. Add a little bit of the green and paint this very dark colour in here. So we don't need a black. I shan't be using black at all in this painting. Don't need it. All the way down there. That's curve, that edge. We can make our blacks, we can make our darks by using very deep blues and browns. Down here. Some of that dark a little bit more shaded into that bit there. So it comes around. Right down to hit this edge here up into there, a the reflection then, tiny touch of taps into that paint just to get it flowing a bit better and we'll look at painting in later, I've got some other photographs of the inside of the um, engine, we'll look at um, putting more detail in there, the leg of the engineer and the fire as well, but at the moment let's just get base colours in and get this covered up. Right, we've got that. A little bit darker still up this edge. So that that gradually comes down in shadow and in arc. Now, top of the funnel is very dark like that. Not an easy brush to use, this one's getting a little bit ropey now, I might have to change brushes soon and get a really neater brush. I've been scrubbing away with this one. You tend to just keep using the same old brushes, they become favourites if you like. Let's bring that funnel down into there and just blend it in. A little bit darker on that edge there as well. A little bit of reflection there, of the green. Take some of that green, deeper green, and just put it in there. But now, we need this darker colour here and we come down one tone 
and it's slightly yellow I'm going to take a little bit more of the yellow ochre again and just add that into that look straight into the paint mix it on the canvas in this case all the way along there down to the I believe where that red side is on the edge of the engine so that was a little bit more yellow just coming down to there the brush, go back to that lighter blue, a little bit more cerulean in the green and we just come back to this area here where I want a bit more of that cerulean blue reflecting in there. It's often uh, the greens have a great variety in them and cerulean is quite a turquoise green so a turquoise blue, it, it's uh, almost into the greens being turquoise. Right, and along there, that's reflected that. Now let's go right down to those darks again. Our ultramarine and burnt umber. Right into here. The whole of this bit, I was painting in dark. So I like painting by numbers, we'll block in these shapes first and then come back in with smaller brushes and uh, gradually build up the details. And that will give these paints time to dry as well because I need to be able to paint details over the top. So these first layers are going to have to dry off a bit before I can work over them. I could work very heavy paint, but I don't want to be too heavy in this case, I just want to gradually build up my effects. I won't put in the details of all the pipe work and everything yet, let's just get basics in. Thin that we'll take a bit more paint. We don't want to uh, put too much terps. Very dark, right down to in between the railway lines here. This is the idea: is to get rid of this white canvas as soon as we can. starting to establish where things are now. Now as I was saying up here about the uh, sky, there are going to be several greys I'm going to mix for the sky. One of them is going to be uh, alizarin crimson and viridian green, which does give out a wonderful green grey obviously. So alizarin crimson and viridian green and to mix them up now I have plenty of white to that because we're going to need that to play against the warmer greys I'm going to make with burnt sienna and ultramarine. Just try a little bit of that grey on there. Here we are. Look, that's quite a dark at the moment. But we will be putting quite a lot of this in as it goes on. Oops, don't want that. Flooded too far, too much turps on the brush, sucked it up. But it doesn't matter because I can put it back later. So this lovely warm greeny grey, which is very effective as you can see. Now a lot more white into that. Come along the top of the train here before I go cooler with it. 
just to get my reflection of the sky going straight away. People might have gone straight away for a lighter green, but that isn't the case. If something is shiny, it doesn't always shine the colour that the surface is. It will shine the light that's shining onto it. So in this case, it's going to reflect the sky. And we're going to make it a lot lighter yet. We're going to make it a lot creamier. So just to give a base coat. Right, now I'm going to take some cerulean and white and add that into that. To start to link with the lighter blue that we've already done on the side of the train. See the effect we're just starting to get now of reflections around the barrel of this. Now it's got much warmer. I'm going to take a little yellow ochre and white and some of that grey into that and we'll just bring some of that down there you see the effect we get by that because we're going to be using this yellow ochre and white later in the clouds what the shininess of this gloss paint now is that colour anywhere else? well yes in fact it's quite dark this is actually up here it's a lot greyer so I'm going to add a bit more of the umber and this time ultramarine to it to give a darker grey up here. You start to see the difference between these colours and they won't be different until we see them one against another. You can't just paint a colour in and say that's it done. It really doesn't work that way. I wish it did. We've got to get them relevant and correct one to another. So a much warmer grey base coat. Quite different to that purpley grey there. In fact, I think I might paint the sky in soon, just to get rid of that vast area of white anyway. So I'm going to take a larger brush. I'm going to start with a yellow ochre and white, creamy grey. Nice big filbert. Use the same spot I was just using, get a little white onto my brush. So I've already got some of that grey colour in it. That will give me a nice, before I even use the yellow ochre, so you can start to get a light grey going on in places. Let's get this painted in, shall we? Get the greys going. You can blend one grey into another here. Look at these pencil marks now. A little bit bluer in places as well. Scrub out the pencil marks. And in some cases, just leave them showing through like I am there so I can see where they are for my drawing later. Don't worry about going over things a little bit at the moment. We're going to bring all this up in detail later. Now, a bit more white and a little touch of the yellow ochre. We'll start to get some more creams, creamy greys going here. And how many there are, just what a variety there is of them. It's not just one black and white grey by any means at all. Right down to the roof. More white. Take a little bit of um, cobalt this time. So I want a slightly lighter blue going up into the clouds here. Just as if the sky is just breaking through the steam up here. And over here as well. And then we'll turn it back into a grey. We'll add a little bit of burnt sienna to it. I got it anywhere else. 
Press that brown comes down into here. Well, when you've got a colour on your brush, if you make a mistake and you've got a colour that you know is going to be used elsewhere, well, do that. So we get the sooty effect of smoke and steam, as well as the sky gently showing through in places. And you can just see the tones, different tones of the blues and the subtle greys playing one against another. And I can smooth this with my finger as well to get the soft smoky effect. We don't have to have little brush strokes everywhere. We can use our fingers to we can bits of cloth or anything to blend them to get the effects we want. It doesn't really matter what subject you're painting, as long as you can get the right colours in the right places and the right shapes, it's going to work. This blue sky just gleam through the steam. A bit stronger and stronger, so I'm going to take that alizarin and the green again. I'm going to just strengthen it a little bit. I'm going to take a little bit of the burnt sienna now, and a little bit of the ultramarine, just to strengthen that grey a bit more into here, making it a little bit warmer. And we can put a bit of lighter colour on later when the steam is built up a bit more. But this just gives us our basic glow. Well, I've got that colour on my brush, of course. It's going on in the background as well. So it's got to go through this window here, hasn't it? You see, with this white canvas, it's throwing us out a bit because we're thinking that the, the grey is very dark. But in fact, once I've painted in... There's a mirror going on there. Once I've painted in all of the white, it's going to look a lot darker. It'll make a lot more sense. And that same colour is reflecting down here all the way along this carriage, that same light grey, which looks quite a mid-grey at the moment, but will go a lot darker once I get the other colours in. And a little bit along here, and certainly up the edge of this carriage roof, which are quite bluey greys. So I'm going to add my cobalt blue to that same grey just now, a little bit of yellow ochre, Bring it back again, a tad of the alizarin to make it a bit warmer. That's what we get with that. There we go, there's a nice grey. Sure lots of mist into here. Again, with a little lot darker and lighter wherever it needs in spots later. The first thing is to get these colours just to get this established. And make sure that our colours are right, whatever. There's no point finishing one part and then think, oh, that's all right. And then you go back later on and find it's totally wrong. You really need to, first of all, get um, these colours as near as damn it and check them. The cool's coming into the trap, the um, sleepers here. Now that I've established that lot, I got rid of most of the white canvas. Let's get that roof right just there. There we go. I'm going to come back to my small brush again. Look we'll at some of the reds down here. Just start to start with some of the brighter colours and the yellows and things. Again, just to make a coherence, start pulling it together. Yeah, the drawing of that still out. Uh, that angle isn't too bad, but this one needs to come up a lot more. Right, the red. Don't make it too garish. I think we're going to need, first of all, um, some cadmium red with a little bit of rose. Bring that down a bit. There we are. So very bright, but it might be alright. You can always tune it down a bit with some uh, glue later. For the moment, let's just get this colour painted in. Trouble with these, what are these colours? Is they are not, unless you paint them with a bit of body colour, a bit of white, 
and not very opaque, they tend to be a bit thin. And the same on this piece that I've left white at the moment, so that I could get fairly clean colour in. If I paint over the dark, unless it's completely dry, it's going to lift it slightly, so we want to leave white areas where we want a lighter colour. So you see this isn't a really bright red. To go a bit brighter I should do that a bit later on. That's it. A little bit of cadmium orange into that. That get the paint to work. There we are. There's a the difference in the different reds and the orange is that we get cleaner and brighter effects of colour. Now while I've got that on my brush the top of the buffer here is a lighter orange. Okay time now to start on some of these other lighter areas. Before I do that and I've still got some light colours left we'll just come in some of these areas and finish them off. Again, detail is going to be needed afterwards, but for the moment, let's get the base colours in. Now, this yellow here, not a very bright yellow. We'll use some chrome, which is a, a warmer yellow. Going to use a bit of body colour with the yellow. I tend to find yellow is a fairly transparent colour, so I'm going to take it, I'm going to add some white to it, and then a little yellow ochre to bring that down more. Let's see if we get near the colour there. That's more like it. It's sort of orangey yellow. Slightly duller, duller than uh, cadmium. And that orangey yellow is going down. Yellow ochre to it, I think. Just make a bit more golden down there. That's better. That's a better colour. Now down here, it's a much more yellow ochre colour. In fact, it's almost pure yellow ochre, but just that fraction. But the thing is, we're gradually getting rid of the... white. Talking of greens and yellow ochres. And all I'm doing at the moment is just finding the basic colours. I'm not even going to detail. I just want to lose this white and get the base colours sorted out. Sometimes we just stain the canvas so you can see the other colours through underneath. Doesn't matter. Fill them up afterwards. This helps us to still know where the drawing is. These little subtleties of texture using the bristles of the brush to give me form, letting it just gradually merge down so that we get the illusion of lots of detail rather than actual. You can see we're well on the way to covering the surface. Even our whitest of whites don't have to be that bright yet. So we've covered the white canvas of just about. That's what we needed to do to, to see what we're doing. Now it's just a matter of building up the colours much more carefully and more and more detail. And so we gradually take the looser work and tighten up and tighten up onto it. In a painting like this, I'm going to have to paint in almost every little detail. But we still have to use the right colours. And make sure that the perspective remains correct as well. So, get our perspective correct on that. And as I start to get these details in, things will make more sense space starts to appear because we're painting these little bits of shadow and light against dark, rough against smooth end, which we talk about. Now we've got to start putting in some of the lighter highlights. So I'll mix up a cream a little tiny touch of 
the other mocha just to soften it down a bit because it'll be too cool otherwise. We're putting in the white lines. I'm not being absolutely perfect. I'm gradually, gradually building this up. Right, I think we need to think about some of the texture down here. And for that, I want to use either a very stiff bristly brush or a sponge. I'm going to use this old bristly brush at first and just see if we can uh, get some of this texturing going. Now I think we'll start with the darks. So I'll make a, a bluey grey. Again we'll use some ultramarine and uh, bounce the ender in this case to start getting some texture going with the brush. Twist the brush as you go along. Try not to make Penny here, I'll try not to make it all look the same. So a sponge will give this effect as well, but just for the moment I want to use this bristle brush to scumble and stipple. So scumbling is rubbing it across, stippling it is pushing it in into this texture here. I'm trying to we don't want is any marks the same, which look a little bit there, a bit samey, so I've got to be careful how I've got to. And gravel. No, nothing ever looks the same everywhere unless it is in nature and repeated like a butterfly's wing. But otherwise nothing is going to be quite the same. Again. So is my brain will be after this either. Okay, now we mix up the next lot. I'm going to put a bit more oh, uh, so cobalt in with this one. Go over towards put more blues a bit more into this. So working up these textures quite nicely, I'm going to give a little bit more warmth into them now. Can start adding a bit more brown in there, so, so careful not to get the same marks. It's so easy to just use the brush almost as we have there and get exactly the same marks going, which we really don't want to do. We must always try and vary the stippling. So I've got some of the darker colours there now, let's start to look at some of the lighter. I'm going to add some white to it now and a little yellow ochre to so warm it up to a warm grey. Let's see if we can start to stipple in now the warmer grey here. Maybe even a little touch of cadmium orange. It's rather nice warm grey. Just to make even lighter and yellower yet. A little touch of more yellow into it now. Let's make it a little cream up. We'll raise the stakes yet again. And it's quite strong. It's a colour here and there. Shining with the sunlight onto this. We we'll start to get a little bit of sunlight gleaming in now. I think if we can. See the difference those warms make so quickly. Suddenly the picture starts to take shape. I want to go to some very light blues. Surprising what a variety of colours there are in something like this gravel. How it glows through the background here. And you see that the picture suddenly starts to come together. So even you've got an old brush that doesn't seem to have much use left in it at all, it can be very useful. Alright, now back to a little flat. I'll just indicate in. Right, now I want to start working with a bit of sponge, seeing what texture we can get with that as well onto here. We need the much lighter colours now. We're trying to get more sunshine across it. So I'm going to make a much lighter pink and orange. Just take some with my brushes to mix it up first because we don't want to be using a sponge to clog it all up with a colour. Take some chrome yellow and white. Maybe a little touch of red. A bit of purple in a minute as well. 
There we go. Now let's try a little bit of that onto it. And hopefully we'll have a nice texture on the sponge as you can see there. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to start placing some of that texture into here. Get this gravelly look. You can see that we aren't actually a long way off finishing, not really. We're well on the way here now. And I think we need a bit more green looking at it now as well, just coming into these bluey greens coming into these gravels because we've got green in there already and it would be better to reflect that back into here a bit more so that it links a bit, look, to not try to stand out too much, so it'll be a part of the whole picture. You know, that pulls it together and it's something that you don't always think of doing. It's putting in colours that you'd never expect but actually are there because they're in colours around it and we need to link the thing together. Which I think is just what I've just done. I might use a bit of sponging along there to just get a bit of a few darks too. That's giving it a, a lot more foundation to our base here. Now, we need to do a little more detail on the tracks themselves. These cool reflected lights, even down the banister here, will make a difference to pulling the thing together, making it cooler. There may even be a little bit of this going on over this side, surprisingly enough. reflecting on top of the engine to really get the feeling of that shininess just there. These last sparkles we're adding. Now I just want to do a bit of work on the uh, engineer. Here we see there's just a black area and his legs sticking out. What I'd like to do is um, try and use a little bit of this photograph, which is rather a nice one if it's actually in there, and just indicate um, the interior of the cab there. It won't be that easy, but we'll have a little go at it. So, here we've got a light. Now we're cheating a bit, but I've got to try and get this as factual as I can, because otherwise there's going to be somebody in the railway engineering scene that will know that I've got it wrong. So I'm going to take some cadmium orange and cadmium red. They will be as colours you'd expect. Get that going round there. And then some pure white and lemon yellow, as clean as we can keep it. Little, little bits of that reflecting in there, all these bits of metal and so on. Try and be as realistic to this as we can. I've got the blue on there. There's some of the tubes and things that are just showing a little bit more here. I need a fraction of colour. In this painting I shall start with the sky and we're going to start as I usually do at the horizon. That is in this case at the horizon just where the clouds meet colour. It's best to start with your white and gradually tint your other colours into it. If you do it the other way around you find you're adding more and more white to get it light enough and you end up with a gallon of paint. As I work upwards I shall as usual make the colours range from cooler to warmer. I start with a mixture of white 
and a little lemon yellow, some cerulean blue and a little bit of emerald green. Then working upwards we have more cerulean, gradually working into cobalt. In some cases I would then work into ultramarine and a little purple, but in this case it wasn't required. The clouds are then made by using the usual greys, mixing blue with browns. There are so many permutations to the greys. In this case, burnt umber and ultramarine blue, but equally burnt sienna is good, and it can use the cerulean with the burnt sienna as well. Here I've also added a little bit of purple to the grey. By doing this we have wonderful control over our cool and warm greys. Sometime try mixing viridian green with alizarin crimson and white. This will also give you a beautiful grey. Just give it some white and just show you, just to indicate to me where... colours are going to be going. Working up this, these blues into each other a bit here. Just blending and so I'm going to work the clouds over this shortly. Down here we've got quite a light yellowy cream again. So let's take our lemon and a bit of white and the tiniest touch of a bit of orange into that and we'll just Bring that colour, that rather nice golden colour again down here. Put it over there already. Down below that bird. Oh, that's a bit darker against the bird, so... Right, now we can start on the actual clouds. We want to work up the mid-tones. We want to work up the mid-tones first of these purple greys. And then we'll um, come in with the lights and work some over the top as well. Finishing up with the very lightest at the end. Not going to do the water yet, go back on that. Let's look at these greys. So I'm going to be using a little bit of uh, purple again there. Let's see that. I'm going to mix some of this purple in with my blue that I've already done. Give me a bit more consistency. A little bit of yellow ochre into that, give it a more golden colour. Let's just try that out. See, the thing is that I'm still dealing with this white canvas. And all the while I've got that there, it's rather throwing me out, but it goes very dark down here. Let's just get this fluffed up here to feed with these clouds. <coughs> I'll darken them a bit more yet in a minute. Mixing ultramarine white, a little bit of uh, burnt sienna to give me this grey. We touch of the purple, but not much. We want to try and gradually build up these dark, fluffy clouds. And you see how, although this is the same photograph of the sky I was using, uh, it's coming out quite differently. We don't need black, we're using the blue and the browns to make our tertiary colour of the grey. I'll start to work up our slightly lighter, warmer greys. So I'm using white, a little touch of cerulean and a wee touch of alizarin crimson now, just to start to feel these warmer Rays amongst here, subtly, to gradually get this feeling of reflected warm light coming up into the sky. So with these slightly pinky tinges, we're just starting to hint at that. Now, with the use of a little cadmium yellow and some rose and uh, white, a little touch of the, the grey, we'd already mix the purple grey. I'm starting to feel some of the pinker colours coming around the clouds. Don't want to make it too strong, it's not a very bright pink yet. It's just subtle colours coming up through here. And right through up into the sky here as well, just reflecting a little bit on these clouds. Hopefully you see now how the sky can be built up in layers working from one 
tone to another and warms and cools between each other as well. Got to go lighter still now with my with my pinks. So I'm taking lemon yellow and rose and white and I'm going to go lighter with those pinks still before I come to my creams. Little bits of light shining here. And gradually build up this. Although it's still against the white down here, this will make much more sense once I've uh, got rid of all that white. I'm going to add a little bit of cadmium red to the pink now to make it warmer. And you'll see I'm painting quite thickly, I'm painting quite in pasto now. I'm going to start putting in some cadmium orange into these. To really go for some warmth amongst them now. These are colours that I wasn't using in the last painting, so I'm taking it maybe a stage further here. Putting little bits of reflected light here and there as well on the clouds. Make the opposites in the colour circle, these reds and oranges are going to make the greens and turquoises stand out a lot more. Finally, a lot of work to do that. I've got to make a much lighter colour for the fluffiness of the clouds. Very light fluffy areas and take a smaller fill back now. And mix up some quite warm but very light cream. So a little bit of the chrome yellow, the white, and just see if we can now find these lovely bits of cloud in here. And I may even need a bit more of the chrome yellow in that because it's quite orangey, very light down here. A lovely slab of light sunlight coming through the cloud there, down through here. As I say, we won't really see the difference in this until <clears throat> I get rid of the rest of the white. But then hopefully these colours will sing out and do what they're meant to be doing. This yellow now so needs quietening down a bit down here. Little bits of sky showing through in places that are important. So for the moment, there we have it, we'll just leave that sky at that and move on to the birds. Up here we've got a heron. I want to uh, make it look as if it's in movement. Let me go to my smaller brush now and make that darker colour which is the Prussian blue and brown and in this case the brown is the burnt sienna. And I've got to paint fairly carefully again because we want this beak of the bird just coming out here. Not too big. Comes into the wing dragging back there. Now if I take my blue I'm cutting around that now to get his shape right. I'm going to try and get the feeling of this bird winging its way across the sky there. And now we want to focus in on the mallards. We'll do this main one first. Now with the mallard um, we've got some lovely greens and warms to deal with and this lovely bright red leg. I think I should start with the green here and I'm going to start with a very very light green first of all. This green here which uh, I should start with as a yellow green. It's in other words it's like emerald mixed with um, chrome. It's going to be a very very light green indeed. So I should take this yellow green and a little bit more lemon yellow to it still and let's just try that colour out, shall we? Yes, that's not far out. It's a nice light green that I want to just give an undercoating to it on the head here to get the 
the brightness shining at first and then we'll gradually, almost like a watercolour, we'll gradually work it up. Small brush at first, right down the neck with that gleaming. Now I want to go to a slightly stronger yellow green. But you see the effect of the head here is not just one colour. It's several colours put together. I need now some emerald green, which is a much bluer, more turquoisey green to shine up and through here. Right down there. That gives us the green we want. Now I've got to come on to the much darker colours. I'm going to take some viridian green, come back down the edge here. Very acidic, strong green. I'm going to go over that in a moment with a much, much darker on this Prussian. This is just to get my underpainting and find the shape and let these colours gleam through because as I was saying just now it isn't just one colour sometimes that will give the effect. You have to have one colour next to another colour to get an impressionist if you like glowing. You can just begin to see the lovely glowing colours of this mallard coming. It would be lost if we didn't do this technique. Right, darker still, now I'm going down to my Prussian and the little touch of the brown and we we'll really start to get these blues darker colours which will make this suddenly shine and glimmer I hope. There his eye comes. So we're now working down with this darker mixture of Prussian and I'm going to put a little bit of cobalt back into there in a moment. gradually tone in, blend in these darker colours. Little tiny strokes just to get the feeling of these feathers gleaming in the evening light. Now a bit of pure ultramarine and we'll just come around here putting in some deeper blue. That needs to be Lift it just a little bit. I need to go back in with the cerulean and green there. I'm going to take some cobalt blue now. Try and work that down inside here a bit. Really do want to try and get this shininess of the duck. We've just about got that shiny feeling that we're after now. Right, let's look at the beak. So I'm going to start again with something quite light. I'm going to start with cadmium orange and a little bit of white. Just to give it some body colour. Come down from there. I'm going to have to cut into this a bit because the beak is not quite looking as I would like. In our pure cadmium orange, and see if we can find that colour in there a bit more. That's better. And then slightly more red on top of that. And 
while I've got that colour on my brush, let's just look at these legs here. I'm putting that lighter orange first. Paint those in completely with that. We can come back in with the red afterwards over that to get the really bright orangey red that we want to get from the feeling of the mallard's legs like that now very very carefully with the point of the brush and we can make the round point into a blade remember I want to take some of that dark that we made earlier with the deep blue deep blue and a little touch of brown Take the brush into a blade and very, very carefully we have to come in underneath this bird's beak here to give the dark bit there and the nostril just up here. Now I need to come back to the sky just a bit because that needs cutting in to the beak just a bit up here now. It was just a little layer of white left there which we don't want. Come to the, uh, the wing. It's a light brown there first. So let's take some of our burnt sienna, a little touch of burnt umber and a tad of the white and just give it a wash first. As we can use oil paints a bit like watercolours as well. I'll give it a thin coat just to get rid of the white canvas which is not very nice as I was saying, can't really work with that. Find the feather structure. I'll come back in with the dark over that in a minute, almost white at the edge. We'll bring that out in a moment by using some dark against it. And then just there it is in fact white. I was near down it in this picture. But again you won't really see that until I put the darks in around it. And while I've got white on my brush, let's uh, put this white collar which we all know so well with the, with the mallard here. the other lights in later. Let's go back to the darks and we need a deeper brown, a feather structure here at the wing edges. So I'm using, I'm using burnt umber with a little touch of Prussian in it. So we've got the feathers splaying out there as the bird hurtles up into the air. lo and behold the bird starts to appear and gradually now building up to the very final little touches of white and fluff going in just to finish off these white feathers and laying them over the top means that I can just be a little bit sharper and uh, thicker with my with my paint to give that feather effect. Hopefully that's what we've got. I hope that you agree. We've got the movement there. So that's that mallard done. Now we'll move to the two that are taking off. Now these two that are flying off. The photograph is rather distant. I've tried to work from all my own photographs and uh, these two were taking off quite a way away. But they're rather nice compositions so let's see what we can do with them. First of all I want to use quite a light 
colour. So I'm going to use my cream with a, a little, little more white into it, just to make the whole bird, first of all. And again, I'm going to get this feeling of movement on the camera. It's a bit blurry because of the movement at that speed and that camera shutter speed. Well, I've got the colour on my brush, then I need to do similar on the other bird. And I can start working into this with the, the darker colours again. And down there for the beak. We're using blue rather than green at the moment. Find these bits of blue and darker colour coming down the wing. Go to a slightly deeper blue with a mixture of the ultramarine and a little bit of Prussian just coming down into the tail there. This one's wings. So we're using that umber now and that's the bouncy Anna to be slightly more stronger in the brown, a bit richer. You can see the effect it's having now. Now a little bit of the orange and cadmium red. We'll just see if we can find these duck's legs a bit here. A little bit more orange perhaps in the bird itself. Parts of it just there. Just a few marks give the impression of these colours. Right, so we now we come down to the uh, water. We've done this bit, now it's this bit to do. We'll put that in afterwards, but get these lines of light colour in first. I think we'll make just one overall uh, colour and then gradually start to make our lighter blues start off with a fairly purpley blue. How light is it? Take a little bit of purple, a little bit of ultramarine, just test it. Yeah, that's not far off for a part of it there. So a little bit of a little more purple, a little bit more uh, yellow ochre. Give me something more golden yellow colour down here. That light changes across the water. At the moment I'm just painting horizontal strokes but I will want to come back into this with uh, more vertical to get the feeling of more depth in a minute. All right, so now we'll just start to blend that a bit downwards. I want to get the depth of the water first, the reflections first and then we'll go for the surface afterwards. So don't paint surfaces even though they're mirrored flat all the way across. Let's get some of these areas of more purple first. So just plug it into the canvas. Let's get rid of that white canvas for the moment. Um, you can't see wood for trees. Alright. Now some cobalt blue and some white. Let's get rid of the canvas down here. Take that same colour and go back up into there. And that's got rid of the base white. Now I can start to do a bit more of this business of feathering the reflections in. And just to move a bit of it out. Now down here. It's a lot warmer, so I take a bit more of the cobalt and a little touch of ultramarine and we'll start to a bit more blues going on. And we 
going to actually add a little bit of Prussian to it with that cobalt and a wee touch of the purple just to warm it back a bit. And we'll drag that backwards and forwards through here using the tip of the brush to start to get the feeling of ripples going on. I'm going to have to use a smaller brush for this in a minute, but just to get me started. There's a lot bluer shape back here amongst this as well. In here. Also that comes out on this side. Now we can use our fingers as well with this remember, to smooth things in, to blend, to get the softer effects. I'm not stuck with just a brush, and there are various brushes for doing various jobs too. If I use my fingers, look at the soft effect I can get when I want to blend these horizontal marks in those very soft ripples, ever so gentle ripples, right through. There we go. Now, I used to look at this background, so I'll take a, a small brush again, down to my small velvet. Brushes don't last that long in this sort of job. And it wants to be a slight purple tint first of all, a distant movie purple. Quite dark. So I'll take some uh, Prussian blue and a little bit of mauve. And just feel this far edge. Yeah, it is, it's as dark as that, and we'll form these distant trees. into those still. A bit more Prussian blue and a touch of brown. Just feel one or two of the dark areas in here. But it's still very distant so we still want to keep it cool. Now we need the warmer band to get rid of that bit of white of marsh just coming in before that. So I'll take some yellow ochre, a little bit of burnt sienna, a touch of burnt umber, now, whilst we've got that on the brush, there are areas of that colour that are coming into those trees as well. So we shall just tickle in the trees, little areas of the same colour to get this marsh coming into these sand dunes and trees in the background. I say at the moment I've been going almost entirely along with horizontal marks, but we shall need to start to look from now on at doing a lot more vertical ones as well. I'm afraid it just does take time. There's no real fast way about doing this because you can't just get a sponge and sponge bits on. We have to look at all these little marks and try and make sure that none of the marks I do are ever the same, that they're always slightly different. Instead of using the point of the brush, I'm using the pointed stick end of the brush to put in these very, very tiny dots. The tool suits you for the job you need to do. All these little girls gleaming in the background here in the sunlight. And again, we've got to the stage where it's just about there, too much detail. 